welcome to FOB TV, the future of business. I'm so excited today uh, to introduce my guest, but I should probably introduce myself first. I'm Kevin Benedict. I'm a futurist and partner here at TCS. So now let me introduce my guest, Bruce Timken from Qualtrics. Thanks for joining us, Bruce. Cool. Great to be here. Thanks. Now, Bruce is head of Qualtrics XM Institute. He's also the co-founder and chairman emeritus of the Customer Experience Professionals Associations. All right, this is going to be a fun one. So talk to me, Bruce. Where are you calling in from? So I'm calling in from right outside of Boston. And if you're asking, yes, Red Sox, Celtics, Patriots, um, it's all in my heart. All right. So you're, you're not a, a Buccaneers fan now? So I, I, um, I, I love Tom Brady. Um, I think he's a class act. And as long as the Buccaneers aren't playing the Patriots, I'm a, I'm a fan. All right. So before we take a deep dive into uh, experience management and all things experience, Bruce, talk, let's, let's just take a moment to uh, define some things here and talk about them. For folks that are unfamiliar with Qualtrics, give us a, a paragraph or two on what Qualtrics does. Sure. So Qualtrics is a leading platform for helping organizations understand and act on signals and feedback from human beings. Now, sometimes those human beings are customers, sometimes they're employees, sometimes they're prospects, sometimes they're people working on big IT projects. But our platform, we have a technology platform that's built to be able to take insights, whether they're feedback from surveys or signals from, from unstructured data like social media or whether they're notes from a sales call, all of that stuff, come together, understand it and act on it. And, and that's what Qualtrics is all about. How do we help organizations improve their business by acting more effectively based on insights from human beings? From human beings. Interesting. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Now, let's get specific on Qualtrics XM Institute. Talk yep. to us about that. So that's a part of uh, Qualtrics that I lead. Uh, and our mission is to create a thriving global community of XM professionals who are both inspired and empowered to radically improve human experiences. So wh what does that mean, right? Sounds lovely. Uh, it means that my team and I wake up every day trying to understand how the people in the trenches at organizations are using insights and putting to action in their organization. Um, so we're, we identify best current and emerging best practices. We identify trends. Um, we do a lot of um, first party research to understand all that. We're publishing all the time. We have a global community of almost 6,000 experience management professionals that we lead and we have lots of events around and we have certifications both for people who are in the field and for people who are just interested in the field. Ah, thank you for giving us that roundup of all those things. So this is a, a phenomenal area. I know that Qualtrics is riding high. Um, they're a recent public company and uh, you guys are just phenomenal and you've got a lot of press. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be kind of uh, turn the page and look at all these different things and understand about Qualtrics because you guys are just doing phenomenal work. So let's define experience, Bruce, because, you know, we talk about experiences in the business world in all kinds of different contexts, like customer experience, user experience, onboarding experience employee experience, and you've given us some definition already, but are these all the same thing? Or are these all just different components of, or individual things that stand on their own? Talk to us about experience. Yeah, no, I, I, I love the question because yes, things can be confusing, especially if you don't spend your life and your entire professional focus on it like I do and like the, you know, certainly the people across Qualtrics do. So I want to, I, I'd like to start with the absolute basics. Everything evolves around the singular concept of human experience, right? Every interaction that a human being has creates an experience and they perceive it through three lenses. Success, can they accomplish what they want to do? 
effort, how easy or hard it was, and emotion, how it makes them feel. So think about it. Every time we interact with another person or another organization or another whatever piece of content, a radio ad, right? All of those create experiences. Now, in different settings, those experiences motivate people to do different things, whether like you talked about, whether it's customer experience, employee experience, whether you're a fan at an arena, a patient at a hospital, an employee in a Zoom meeting, all of those things have experiences. And so what we talk about when we think about experience management in general is how do we better understand the effect of those experiences so we can do things that create experiences that um, enable the people we care about to get the things done that they want to do. So hopefully I, I, you know, I gave you a lot there, but at the foundation yeah. of it, everything is focused on the experience of an individual human being in different settings. Thank you for doing that. You know, my wife and I, uh, when we go out to restaurants, especially nowadays, it seems like the turnover in employees at restaurants is happening so quickly that they're like the staff is always in training. And we were just talking over dinner last night that it's OK for us to go in where everybody's training, especially if they if they uh, acknowledge it and ask for us to, you know, just thank us for being patient as they go through this learning process. Uh, but last night we were in a restaurant where they didn't acknowledge that everybody was in training and nobody knew what they were doing. And that was a whole different experience because it, they just ignored it. So I was, yeah. you know, that was an example just this week where I was thinking, you know, two restaurants, both training new staff. One was a great experience. The other one wasn't. So I, I, I love that example. And I, I'd love to extrapolate on that a little bit. Right. So because I think you, you touched on really, uh, while it's one little example, it's representative of sort of how we can think about some things around experience management. Right. So the I talked about it, the experience you had as you know, a patron of a restaurant, you had the, you had a bunch of interactions. And like I said, they they you perceive them, whether they were successful, whether they were hard or easy with effort and how they made you feel. But recognizing how human beings behave, which is fundamental to experience management, you also knew that if your expectations were appropriately set, you would perceive those interactions differently. So the, the notion of when someone comes in, if right away you say, I am sorry, we're short staffed, it might take a while, right? If that happens at the beginning, then you, how you perceive the weight how you perceive how you're interacted with changes dramatically. That's the type of thing that XM Institute is really trying to teach the world. If you think about it, that's one very narrow case that actually that particular setting expectations to um, affect people's perceptions is something you can apply in employee experience and fan experience and patient experience, right? And you can think about that as one small instance of a zillion other ways in which you can effectively manage someone's experience. Ah, this is going to be fun this today, this discussion. I love it. So recently you wrote, Bruce, just like the laws of nature, which govern how elements of the universe interact with each other, there are also six laws of experience management, which are a set of fundamental truths about experience management that account for how people and organizations behave. Let's talk about those, those laws. People are emotional and not rational. Talk to me about that. It's, it's interesting because people have, there are two ways in which people make decisions, right? We have two sides of our brain. One is rational thinking, which relies on logic and reason and is slow and deliberate. The other one is intuitive thinking, which is fast and emotional and automatic. And in organizations, we tend to really focus on rational thinking. So we think like our clients or our customers are gonna spend the time to collect all the information that's out there, look at the trade-offs, make, make really smart decisions, right? When in fact, that's not how we behave. So even if you think about a human being, think about where like we're going to buy a car, 
right? We may spend months and months collecting information and doing pros and cons and saying we want to have something that has air conditioning, this miles per gallon, this trade in, right? We do all these things and we go to the, the lot and say, oh, I love the red one. Let's buy it. Well, it turns out that I love the red one, let's buy it, is how people make almost all of their decisions. So if you think about it, if our organizations are optimizing and trying to make content and processes that support rational thinking, right, then we're missing the opportunity to really make things easier for people by supporting their intuitive decision. And some of those intuitive decision things are like, you know, there's a status quo bias because we, we oftentimes talk with this one about really understanding people's heuristics and biases. Heuristics are rules of thumb that people use so that they don't have to make a decision about everything in their life, right? A heuristic is, right, you, like you do not think about when you wake up in the morning whether you're going to use your right hand to lift up the, the covers and whether you're going to go out of the bed with your left foot or your right foot for first. You sort of just do those. Um, those are sort of heuristics. We sort of just operate. Um, and then biases are things like we have a status quo bias, right? Human beings will choose to do nothing before they'll put energy in to do something. So for instance, one of the things over the years that people have learned, we wanted people to, to opt into 401k, you know, decades ago when, 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 when the U.S. shifted its focus away from having people have predetermined retirement plans to 401ks, which are opt-in, self-managed, right? Um, people weren't doing it at a high level. And that's because we gave them a whole bunch of information, but they had to opt in. So when we looked at that collectively, I wasn't part of that looking at, we said, well, maybe instead of having people opt in, we have them opt out, right? Um, so we actually make it easier for people to do the right thing as opposed to trying to give them a thousand pieces of information while they have to actually act. So that's what we mean there. We mean, how do you actually support the way human beings make, mo make most of their decisions? And that's with their intuitive thinking. Now, if only companies would do that with healthcare benefits. Yes. Well, so I, I think healthcare is a perfect example of that, right? Not only are there in healthcare, we want to think about benefits, but we want to think about what is the appropriate human behavior so that people can actually stay healthy. In healthcare, where I think the more interesting things are, which is how do we promote healthy behaviors? And I do believe that this, this law of people are emotional, not rational, is really, really important when we think, it, think about behavioral change, long-term behavioral change. Mm. So journeys add meaning to moments. Talk to us about that. Law number two, love it. If, so, if a customer goes on to like a, a website like Expedia to book a flight, is their goal really to get a ticket or to have a reservation experience? No, they're ultimately doing that because that's part of a broader journey that they're on. Maybe they're going on a business trip. Maybe they're going on a trip with their family, a vacation with their family. So journey out of meanings moments is the fact that the more we can understand the context, the journey, what's the goal of the person? What are they trying to achieve? What does success look like? The more we can do that, the better we can optimize the individual touch points along the way, like going online to book a reservation. Because if we understand that it's a, that maybe it's a family going on vacation, we might be able to offer up slightly different times that are much cheaper or offer up packages that are family oriented that will be valuable for someone in that role. But, you know, things that would make no sense if it's a business traveler who's just trying to, you know, get to a city to go to a meeting and come home. Brilliant. So number three, actions transform insights into value. One of the interesting things that's grown out of the experience management world, and it sort of started in customer experience and broadly around experience management, is the notion of using insights, right? People collect data, analyze data, try to put in data, but one of the really truths about it is data on its own isn't valuable. And you know what? Neither are insights. At the end of the day, if you are not doing something different based on what you're learning, 
you might as well not do all the steps beforehand. So when we say actions transform insights into value, we really want to make it clear to, to people that it's less important what insights you generate. It's less important there than it is really focusing on those decisions that you interrupt, those new experiences that you deliver based on the insights. So really, it's those actions that really take all of those insights and make them valuable. Ah, brilliant. Thank you for sharing. Uh, number, what is this? Four. Yeah, four. Commitment aligns behavior. Organizations who want to build long-term success, right? If you're an organization and you want to, you know, you're, you're going to thrive, it means you are going to have to evolve over time, right? Which means you're going to need your people to make shifts and changes in what you do. So you need to have people act consistently with the direction you're going in. Now, there are two ways to do that, compliance and commitment, right? You can get people to comply. You can make them follow rules all the time. But as soon as something changes around them, as soon as the environment gets a little bit off, you lose their support, right? And they won't give you all their energy because they're just doing exactly what you tell them. Right. So you can get people to comply by telling them do this and only do that, or you can get them to comply by getting their full commitment. And a lot of this has to do with sort of how leaders behave. We oftentimes talk about purposeful leadership here. So purposeful leadership are leaders who provide a vision and an understanding about why things are happening and then draw people in around them into wanting to be part of that ultimate vision. Um, so that's what we mean there, that you really need to have commitment, people committed to joining you on your efforts, not getting them to do what you want to do be, just because of rote um, pushing them there. Great. Number five, leaders boost or break inertia. What do you mean by that? So if, if you're leading, oftentimes, you know, I talk about experience management is um, really valuable when we're trying to transform our organization some direction, right? We really want to become better or prepare for the future or whatever, right? Um, which means we are going to have to change something about what we do now for how we're gonna operate in the future. And oftentimes it's a lot of things that are gonna change. But it turns out that, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, just in terms of individual experiences, people in general, don't like to change. Pretty much if you go through and you ask people, does the organization need to change? They'll oftentimes say yes. And then you ask a second question, do you need to change? And the answer is no, right? So you can get broad agreement that the organization needs to change and you get broad agreement that each individual doesn't believe that they need to change. So it really takes leadership to instill the notion and get people off of the rut of thinking that what we're doing today is what we need to keep doing into the future. Got it. The last one, number six, experience management is a habit, not an act. This is my, my favorite of the laws. And it's because when I think about experience management, I think about it as a capability that's woven through your entire operating fabric, meaning it's not something you do once in a while, right? It's not about a great experience here or a great recovery of experience there or using a rich insight to make an innovation over yonder. It's really about how do we make sure that we continually operate in a way where we're using insights about human beings to update and change all of our processes so they work best for the things that really matter to every organization, and that's people. Because at the end of the day, everything that an organization does is about creating experiences that create value for people. At the end of the day, we're, we're creating value for employees, we're creating values for partners, we're creating value for customers, so the better we can understand that and weave it into our HR practices, our CIO, our IT infrastructure, our finance department, every department, 
every process can be better, done better, if it takes into account a rich understanding of the human beings that it touches. And among those human beings are your own employees, aren't they? Yeah, let's take a moment to talk about that. How have you seen the pandemic impact employees' experiences? You must hear a lot of things and talk to a lot of people about that. Yeah, the, the, the pandemic has been um, really interesting in the impact it has on employees across so many different dimensions, right? And, and let me talk about a few. One is the clear one, right? Immediately, people who are in offices shift to working from home. Big shift, right? So that means that those people needed to have experience like, like what was it like to work from? Did, did, you know, did they have the proper technology, the proper um, skills? Did they have the, the meeting set up? All of the infrastructure, whether it's technology or process or operational, um, changed how people viewed work. So there, we had to start worrying about employees because in order to make them productive, we need to understand how they operate in this new environment and make sure they could do the things they wanted to, we wanted to do. At the same time, the things that people do also changed, right? Because business models changed. So, you know, if you think about the restaurant example, right? The restaurant you went into, the two restaurants you went into, they probably closed down and didn't have in-person dining for a while. So the employees that still had jobs, many of them didn't, Right. But the ones that still had jobs, instead of waiting tables, they were packaging up food for this new delivery that had skyrocketed for those restaurants, which created a new set of roles for employees that were different from the old roles. Right. So we had to manage through that change. And and also what happened um, and this is this was really sort of an interesting thing for me. And I, I, I think it's one of the real positives if you can say there are positives through this sort of last couple of years, is the realization that organization had that to be able to pivot effectively, they needed their employees to be actively involved for a couple of reasons. One is they recognize that employees oftentimes pick up on signals before they even hear it with customers, right? Employees are seeing what's going on, right? Yeah. So if we can have a really good mechanism to have feedback from employees about what they're seeing, we can make faster changes. And the other thing is, as we want to make faster changes, we need employees on board with it, right? Because in the old days, if we're just, well, you know, if you think about the last couple of years, organizations made lots of pivots. So they've learned when it comes to that, the XM Institute has labeled 2022 the year of agility. Because I think all the things we're talking about is we've built agility and underlying agility, a fundamental underlying of any agility capability is that employees are a critical part of it. So I've, I've seen over the last couple of years that organizations have taken a much more, um, have considered employees much more central in both listening to them, understanding what they need to do to be productive at work and helping to build agility. And then, you know, that's a few. You layer on top of that, what, what else have we seen? The, the very important growth of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging as fundamental beliefs that lots of organizations have around their workforce. People call it the great resignation. I call it the great onboarding because, yeah, people may be leaving, but the really smart companies figure out how they bring on the best of the best. Um, but in all of that, that just, it just shows, I think, a lot of unrest we as human beings and society have gone through over the last couple of years, and we're all just trying to figure it out. Oh, yeah. So experience management. Let's talk about the management part of that. So what's involved in actually managing a large multinationals organization? How do you do? How do you manage experiences? What's that process yeah. look like? You build capabilities to continuously learn how the people you care about are thinking and feeling, right? You um, propagate those insights to the people across the organization that can do something with it in a form that they can act on it. 
And then you rapidly adapt what you're doing in your organization based on that flow of insights. So it's really about how do we build the capability to continuously learn, propagate insights, and rapidly adapt. Um, and that's what we're creating. So that's the capabilities. Now, underneath those capabilities, to actually make that happen, we talk about something we call it the XM operating framework. Three components, technology, competency, and culture. Technology, you need a platform that, that collects the experience data, the experience insights about human beings, merges it with other operational data, and, and generates insights, right? You need to have the competencies, which are the skills and the processes that people have to take advantage of those insights, right? And then you need a culture, a culture that is focused on the needs of human beings, right? At the end of the day, we have to believe that our customers and their experiences are important. We have to believe that our employees and their experiences are important. So those three things together, the technology, competency, and culture are woven together to build the underlying components that gives you the continuously learn, propagate insights and rapidly adapt. So that's sort of the capability. And then you apply mm -hmm. that to employee experience, customer experience, partner experience, fan experience, patient ex experience. You know, I could yes. raise my hand <laughs> like a, for a thousand hours about all the experiences you apply it to. Yeah, I can see the role of culture being so critical there. It's just the way we think about customers and about the way we approach business and how we want to be perceived and how we want to treat people and how we are treated ourselves within our organization. Absolutely. So where do you see the role of technology, AI, machine learning? Because a lot of what you're doing is based on analytics that kind of guide you between bumpers or between the guardrails. You know, am I doing the right things? Is this new product or new approach or new process working the way I intended? Or is it giving off the wrong signals, all that kind of stuff? So what role does artificial intelligence and all these kinds of new technologies play in experience management? I think they're critical, right? So I oftentimes like to step back and think about macro trends to mm -hmm. figure out where things are going, right? So around experience management, one key macro trend is there's a growing, there's a growth of what we call experience data. So experience data is how people is data about how people are thinking and feeling, their preferences, their expectations, their perceptions, their attitudes, right? That's growing, right? And that's only going to continue to grow. And that's sort of a one of the components of what Qualtrics is helping organizations do, right? This so once you have that growth of that experience data and you start to connect it with more operational data like your CRM platform has or your financials have. Now you have an even richer set of actionable data because I'll tell you that once you add the experience data in with the operational data, you have a foundation of insights that is dramatically more valuable than you had in the past with just operational data. So the macro trend is we're building up a larger pot of data that is inherently potentially more valuable. Now, with all of that data streaming in, right, the only way to maximize value from it is to figure out ways for technology to find the insights more and more without human intervention, right? And that's because of a couple reasons. One is that there's going to be so much data and so much insights that human beings won't be able to keep up with it to identify those really important bits. That's one of the reasons, right? So I think machine learning and AI are critical for helping people find the insights, the richest insights in this growing pot of, data, of really valuable data. The second is that we see people using the insights in, in triggering operational flows and operational processes. So it's not only that we need to use AI and machine learning to find things that human beings might not find in a reasonable period of time. We need it to find information that helps drive decisions like when, when a customer calls into a contact center, what do we know about them based on this collection of operational data and experience data 
so that we can actually have an interaction with them on the phone that takes into account who they are. Or if they come onto our website, how do we know if they complained over the phone? Or do we know if they're actually an advocate of the company or a detractor of the company, right? All of that stuff over time, we want to play in to how we treat individuals, more individualized, more micro segmenting. So yes, AI and machine learning are become, I think, going to become even more important. Oh, thank you for that. Pause just a moment here. My dog is being relentless wanting into my office. Yeah, come on. So I hope that this does not get cut out of the recording because I believe that any time in this new world where we're all in our homes, that having a dog and dealing with your dog makes segments like this more relatable to other human beings. Ah, uh, that's great. Well, here, here. Uh. There's my dog. <laughs> oh, awesome. I feel badly. My dog's locked upstairs. I have an English Cocker Spaniel named Willie. What's your dog called? Daphne. Nice. My wife had left on a bike ride. And so, you know, she looks around the house. The house is empty. So it comes in and goes, well, I can hear dad talking. So, and so she's relentless and knocking on the door until I get up and let her in. <laughs> so last question here. Let's put on our futurist hat. If, yeah, if we put on our futures hat and we look forward five years, how do we think experience management will look different? And yep. you know, is, it, is it new kinds of technology, new kinds of processes? Is it a new strategy? Just how do you think it might change in five years? Let me, uh, I'll give you the details, but let me be direct. Yes, yes, and yes. Okay. Um, so I think what we'll see is that experience data, which today, you know, companies are starting to think about will be managed as a corporate asset. So organizations will have infrastructure the same way we have ERP systems, right, to handle their core data. Experience data will be managed as a central set of assets, right, both. So the CIO will be involved in an experience data infrastructure, tech plan, tech, and it'll be a normal part of a tech, tech stack. Um, we'll have deeper integration of human-centric insights into every aspect of business. So now we talk about customer experience and employee experience. I think in five years, we'll be talking more about how are we using experience management in our digital interactions, how are we using experience management, our, our financial team, how we, so it'll just be embedded more in the processes that happen. Um, I think the uh, another thing that we'll see is so we're you know I talked earlier about what XM Institute does we're trying to build a global um, set of capabilities for the professionals who focus on it that profession is growing and so the combination of, of the professionals in the field having more of them them getting more experience and the tech will make everything much easier over time is that there'll be fundamentally a lot more activities around experience management, more fundamental activities. And the last couple of things I'd mention is as all of this happens, I expect to see more personalized experiences, right? As that information is, is much more um, used to trigger differential experiences based on understanding people. And I also expect to see much more informative segmentation. Right. Today, a lot of our segmentation is built on demographic or operational data. Demograph, how old is someone, right? Where are they from? Um, operational data, maybe what have they bought from us? What do they own, right? Um, but I think putting in place an understanding, layering that with an understanding of what are their preferences? Well, um, what are their attitudes towards our organization? Um, all of that together will allow us to create novel segmentations that actually are much more instructive in understanding what people are going to do in the future. So I, I you know, the, the interesting thing is that experience management almost disappears in five years in the form that it's in now and becomes the underlying structure for a lot of what organizations do in different areas. Ah, fascinating. Bruce, I want to thank you so much for sharing your insight and experiences with all of us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, and it was a pleasure meeting your dog. <laughs>